Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the ICAR Tech Center. We're here today to talk a little bit about the ICAR Repairability Technical Support website, otherwise known as RTS, and some of the tools that are available for the collision industry on this website. So we'll start, Scott, talking about the OEM information and the information available on that site. So uh, the OEM information pages are broken down by the OEM. So each OEM has different things that they wanted us to share to the industry that sometimes they can't get outside of their login or they can't uh, get that information out in their normal method and they want more people to be able to access it. So they give it to us so we can help uh, get that information out there. The first one that uh, we want to just touch on real quick is the Honda page. Um, the Honda page, they've asked us to share a lot of different things for their information to get it out there. And there's a lot of different choices you have here. And the center column is really the things that they wanted us to share. This left column is going to be more of the things that ICAR has developed. So it's different searches and things like that that we'll cover in a little bit. And then on the far right, we also have videos on how to navigate their website. So how to buy a subscription and then how to navigate to the OEM information. Um, in a step-by-step -step video to help you get to that information a little easier. Okay, so if somebody was looking, say they're working on a, I don't know, a Honda vehicle, and they want to see their, their repairability matrix for, you know, steel repairability, where would they go on the site to find it? So it varies on OEM, but we do have a radio button here that you can select. And in this case, it's Honda Steel Usage and Repairability. And that takes you to a PDF that Honda shared with us. And this is a, a great document when you're doing repair and replace decisions or trying to figure out what you can do or can't do on a vehicle. And Honda does a great job of breaking it down and giving you some of those little tidbits of information that you're not necessarily going to find in the manual. So this is a separate docu document outside of the manuals they created and had us share. And just to give a little bit more um, of the flavor, we're going to go at the Ford page. And Ford asked us when they rolled out with the F-150 back in 2015 to share the instruction sheets for the F-150 because it was so different from everything else that they had done. And so there's a few different pieces of information on this part of the website. Okay. So... You're on the Ford website now, so if they wanted to take a look at position statements, are those available on there? Yes, most of the OEMs do have position statements, and we'll have them on the RTS website so that they're all in one location for you, so you can go and find that information easily. A lot of times that information is embedded in their repair information. Sometimes it's not even on their OEM information site. Uh, you can only get it from external sources like RTS. And so we gather up all those and put them in that one location, and you know, one thing I always tell people about position statements, it's not the end-all, be-all documentation. A lot of people want to have that because it's a quick, easy, here's what the OEM says. But really, these position statements are to be used to point you into the direction in the repair manual where that information is embedded into the actual repair procedures. All right, great information. So now let's talk a little bit about collision repair news articles. Um, I know these are technical articles that the RTS team writes. Uh, the content for these articles can be anything from, you know, ask ICAR inquiries that, uh, you know, you feel like you need to get the information out to the industry, something that an OEM publishes that you want to get out to the industry, or just hot topic information for the industry. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so collision repair news is really one of the best mechanisms we have when we discover something new. Um, we get it out to the industry, we try to communicate as much as we can to the industry through that because there's so much information that we find when we're doing research. Um, things that come out of a course sometimes end up as articles um, because there might be something that the industry needs to know right away on model specific things or something like that. So like I said, we do three articles a week. They're always technical in nature. And you know we really try to figure out what are the ways that we can help the industry best with some of these articles? And we like to do a lot of series of articles. Um, so this is a good example. Uh, the General Motors, uh, who requires or recommends MIG brazing? And we put this together because MIG brazing questions come in quite a bit. 
people are trying to understand you know, which OEMs allow us to do that. And now the power of some of these articles is we will also link related articles on the bottom of it. So if you're in here and you read an article and you're wondering, okay, does another OEM have something on that same subject? It'll have a link out to uh, that article that will tell you which one um, recommend or use MIG brazing. Another good example of this is the Audi Collision Repair and Material Guides. So this is something that um, we, we found and it's not in the actual repair information but it has a lot of good detailed information that if you're working on an Audi vehicle you need to know about. So we did this article to link some of the different uh, pieces of information for you so that you can find it easily. Um, and one of the biggest powers of this is actually the Google searches because if you Google it, a lot of our articles are gonna have the exact content you're looking for. It'll guide you either to uh, a document like this or it might just point you in the right direction in the repair manual of where to find it. So Google searches are a great help. But one of the other things that we've done, um, I'm gonna jump back to the OEM information page and we've put together these buttons here uh, that's in this particular case is a Ford ADAS button. And what that is, is a gathering of all the collision repair news information that we've put together for Ford. So if it has anything to do with ADAS, calibration, anything like that in a Ford vehicle, it'll show up here. So you don't have to do a bunch of searches. You can come right here and find the article you're looking for on that particular one. So is that ADAS page like that, is that available for all vehicle makers? Yep. Each OEM has their own page. So the Ford and Lincoln ones are, of course, linked because it's the same OEM but there's a separate one for Audi, Volkswagen, all the General Motor one pages have uh, an ADAS button that you can click on as well. So that's a, a great place to start when you're trying to figure out a particular OEM. It's not gonna give you everything you need, but it'll at least show you some of the different pieces you need to know in order to start working on that vehicle. Outstanding. So now let's talk a little bit about calibration. You know, ADAS is a hot topic within the industry. You know, whether we're talking about collision shops needing to understand what options the vehicle could possibly be equipped with, uh, what type of calibration is required, equipment required, you know, the, the information is not easy to find uh, to determine whether or not a calibration is even required. Uh, what does the calibration page on the RTS site uh, do for collision repair professionals to help them find it? Well, you know, this, this search was put together based on a lot of industry feedback. Um, and even our own research, trying to figure out where that information was. And so we decided that in order to help the industry find that information, we needed to put together a few different things to help them find it. So on this particular one, you do a search by year, make, and model. And you click search. And that brings up the Ford Mustang, the 2019 Ford Mustang. And if you click on this little blue link, it brings you to this page. And the information in the header is a lot of the you know, system definitions and things like that, how we've gone through and kind of standardized the naming conventions of the systems because the OEMs have hundreds of names for these different systems. And it just really, it gets very confusing so we've kind of created a standardized name for it and we explain how we did that in that top header. So those links across the top are general information that will be helpful. But once you get into the specific vehicle, we've given it these kind of monopoly card looks so that every time you go into this, any OEM, the colors are gonna be the same for the same system. And then right below that, we give you the OEM name. And that really helps um, just find that information because if you're calling it the wrong thing when you're doing searches or looking in a menu, you're probably not gonna find it if you don't know what it's called. Um, we did a word cloud that had all these different names and some of these names were not very intuitive of what they're actually talking about. Not, not to mention the manufacturers call the same system different things. Yes. So it's, it's, yeah, it's, a, it's a helpful piece on that site. Yep. Yeah. And so then we also will tell you if that system sets DTCs, if there's malfunction indicator lamps that will be set, because that doesn't always happen as we well know. 
Um, just because there's not a dash light doesn't mean there's not a problem in that system. Um, but the real, so the industry talks a lot about systems, but the real issue with anything ADAS related is the camera, the sensor, anything like that. That's what's getting disturbed. If it was replaced, if it was damaged, that's what we really care about. So if you click on one of the, the links, uh, it drops you down within that page to the sensor behind the front bumper cover in this example. So this particular one is involved with adaptive cruise control, collision warning, collision braking. So you might have one sensor or camera that is used by many different systems. So we'll give you the name of that sensor, but we also will tell you when a calibration, initialization or is required for that particular part. And in this case, if the sensor is removed, installed, or replaced, you have to do the calibration. Um, we also will tell you if a DTC will set, if a scan tool is required to do that calibration, and if there's special tools required. And then we'll also sometimes uh, give you a note. So that in this case, if uh, you're replacing the sensor with a new one, you have to do the data download from the old sensor and into the new sensor. And if, it, if it's not available, um, because that, that sensor is completely destroyed, there is a process that you have to follow through the OEM to actually get to that information and download it into that new module. So, you know, this site is really there to help you get to the information you need because there's so much information that you need to understand in order to do these calibrations and get all these systems to work that if you don't know about it, you're going to easily overlook it. Yeah. So, you know, we, we've talked a lot so far about all the information on RTS, but, but what are some of the things in the courses that might help somebody with this kind of information? Okay, well, there are a couple of things that they can do, really. There's, there's the uh, calibration or ADAS uh, page that they can go to on the ICAR website that will have uh, all of the things, essentially everything ADAS that ICAR is working on. Um, so, for example, you'll see in there the, uh, I want to say we're at 13 ADAS courses currently available. They'll range from you know, things like how to find or locate and understand OEM calibration procedures, um, how to prepare your shop for doing ADAS calibrations and ADAS repairs, um, all the way to things like, you know, what do you do when the calibration fails? You know, how do you start the diagnostic process? So all those courses are available within ICAR today. And if you go to that ICAR website, that is the uh, ADAS resources page, it'll include things like webinars, like what we're doing today. But if it's ADAS specific, links to those webinars will be on there. Links to podcasts related to ADAS will be in there. And again, all the information about the, the current ICAR course is available. So with that, let's uh, take a minute and take a look at a conversation that Jeff and Dirk were having earlier on this same subject. So Jeff and I, we want to speak a little bit ADAS, uh, Jeff, and you prepared here a lot of, lot of cool things, and I'm really excited speaking about that. Then this is one of my favorite subjects, and actually what I'm holding here in the hand is already a radar sensor, and Jeff, those radar sensors are pretty cool, and they are not really new to us. Then when I'm looking back a little bit, like I remember like beginning of the 2000s, that vehicle, like those high-end vehicles were equipped already with ACC. And yeah, ACC requires a radar sensor. Then we have to know the distance to the vehicle up front. And, and I think when we're looking also in, not only in the history, in, when we see what is in the current car population out there, ACC means we need a radar sensor. We are standing behind it here like blind spot sensors. And I think the 360 cameras, that's like the top three, in my opinion, on sensors, what we can see and what have to be, of course, calibrated and have to get work on after accidents, are there other bumps or whatever. And I see you have sensors up here, like lasers already here prepared. And I'm, as I said, I'm excited to speak a little bit more about that. Uh, with you and dive into that subject. Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting to see the evolution mm -hmm. of the technologies in the vehicle. I think as we look back through time, um, you know, we've seen the evolution of the body structure 
and the enhancements to collision energy management and occupant protection and the safety systems of the vehicles. And as we, as we see that natural proliferation of the technology uh, from those high-end vehicles mm -hmm. that, that limited the exposure, I think, um, years ago yes. with some of this, uh, to now we're seeing it on a lot of the, I'm gonna say everyday drivers. You know, we, we see that proliferation of the technology down to your, uh, I'll say your more affordable vehicles. And mm -hmm. even some of the baseline models yeah. having, um, you know, a certain amount of ADAS on board. Yeah. So this is, this is something that certainly affects uh, collision repair industry and the automotive service industry as a whole. And, uh, you know, we all face a lot of the similar challenges yeah. with being able to address um, the repairs and calibrations and things of that nature. Uh, a piece of that, in my mind, comes down to, you know, kind of basically understanding what's happening with the systems, how they operate. Uh, another piece of that is accessing the service information, finding, finding that information, identifying what's on the vehicle that you're working on and making sure you're following all the procedures and, and then uh, sorting through the, I'm going to say, the tools and equipment and OEM requirements mm. that go along with it. Um, you know, some of, some of the procedures are uh, uh, relatively easy to interpret. Uh, some of the procedures are very lengthy and uh, complex uh, oh. as you go through the setup and interpretation. And I think this is all uh, a key benefit uh, with the, the RTS portal and some of the resources that are available yeah. there yeah. That, uh, that perhaps help, help the industry uh, through some of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think that's a, a really um, advantageous piece that, uh, yeah. that ICAR brings with the RTS team and their resources. Especially the technical articles, what the colleagues wrote, I don't know how many of that are, like this is in the hundreds of really technical articles about different systems, how they work, how they operate, what kind of problems you may be faced when you calibrate, and all those experience what we're collecting and, and publishing of, uh, with RTS is really, really tremendous. And, that's really cool and that's the reason, yeah, we are here and want to talk about it. What you actually left out in, in, in your thing is always like the driver. And, you know, for me it's always like then I have always this, this picture, I have this car, vehicle at home, what has a few of those assist systems and then I have my wife. <laughs> and she always like, oh, you switched on uh, that weird thing, it's vibrating here and it's vibrating there. And we drive this vehicle now like six, no, three months, and we could drive it three years, and I think she will know, she's not understanding um, those systems. And this is the point, and I explain it to her, and driver education is another, another big piece always in my mind when it comes to, to do those things. All right. And maybe, Jeff, you have to go with me home and help me explain it to her. <laughs> but now I'm kidding. She's yeah, you started off down a path there that's kind of interesting <laughs> because historically, I'm, I'm going to say for the collision repair industry, as we get a vehicle in and we're repairing it, yeah. um, in many cases, uh, yeah. the customers become a little more sensitive and, and um, uh, aware of things in that vehicle. And, you know, is it, is it doing what it used to do? And, and how in tune with, were they with what it used to do versus yeah. what it's doing now? Uh, again, for us you know, as an industry, having a familiarity with the systems, their operation, what they should naturally do or, mm -hmm. or what they're programmed to do is, I think, a more accurate uh, uh, statement to make. Um, you know, that's, that's a piece of it that's, that's that customer interface as, as that vehicle is coming in, being repaired and being returned and ensuring that we can give that customer the confidence level yeah. that no different from airbags. You know, I, I think of whenever airbags first came in and customers came in and, hey, my airbags were deployed, are they going to be okay? There's only one way I know for sure, 100% to know they're going to work, and that's take that vehicle out and test them the hard way. Um, we've run all the diagnostics, the system's proven out, we've put everything back the way it's supposed to be, mm -hmm. and I think there's a parallel there with this technology, with these technologies on the vehicle now, that there are certain things mm -hmm. we need to make sure we're doing right, so we have the confidence when that vehicle is yeah. back to the customer, yeah. that at that point in time, we have done everything we can to ensure it's right, yeah. So whenever it's out on the road, it's going to perform as it should. Test driving a huge point here that we make sure that that system <laughs> operates and works. I'm in this position that I travel a lot and I have the chance to drive different vehicles than I rent always rental cars. 
And then I pick always a car that I never drove, and I look really, I look, oh, that has a camera that has this. Let's check it out, how it works and how it operates. And this is really for myself. It takes me so long while driving and messing with that stuff that I'm not <laughs> giving attention to the road, what well, is really not a good thing. But, and this is the big challenge for our industry, especially the collision industry. They repair so many different models. And now you, you, you never drove it, you never experienced, you don't know how yeah. those things work. And that is, I think, and that's the reason why I said driver education, it's like technician education in how those things work, how those things operate. And this is a big picture, a big, big thing in my opinion, um, where we have to learn all. I learn every time when I'm sitting in those vehicles, how it works. Yeah. Yeah. But now let's talk a little bit more, more technique and more, so what so you did here and what, what do you when, when I think yeah. about whenever I think about the sensors just mm -hmm. I, I want to step back over to those for a minute you know a sensor is basically just collecting information and and whether it's a radar or a camera or for the few vehicles that have lidar um, a lot of vehicles have the ultrasonic sensors in the bumpers that uh, have evolved uh, basic concept of operation still the same um, ultimately you know all it's doing is collecting data about its surroundings and it's collecting that data based on its orientation and its field of view. Now, whenever we look at this blind spot sensor, and I'm not going to speak specifically to this particular sensor in, in, in a sense that um, we don't need to go into the minutia of exactly what are the specs. But these blind spot sensors typically, uh, they'll range anywhere from about 120 degree field of view to yeah. 150, possibly almost 180 degree field of view yep. whenever we look <laughs> at it this way. Um, so that's going to be our, uh, our, our width of field of view, if you will. Um, whenever we look at, at this field of view, I'm going to call it the elevation, you know, coming out of here, this might be a 15 or a 20 degree or 25 or whatever it happens to be, whatever the specification is. These are some of the things that we don't necessarily know um, unless we look at the sensor specific information. Some vehicle manufacturers actually in the service information will tell you what the field of view of the sensors are, but not all of them. Um, so, you know, this, this helps me to understand that, hey, you know what, this thing's got a pretty wide field of view. But with that field of view, uh, what's my orientation? And I think about this whenever I take and I turn my head, I turn my body, and what my peripheral vision sees. I've got a pretty wide peripheral vision. Uh, I start to lose it about here. And, and so, you know, as I, as I lose Dirk in my peripheral, you know, how, how is that, a, that sensor orientation yep. affect uh, by, by the positioning of it? And, and this takes me back to what we have to deal with in the collision industry um, whenever we look at, and I think about structural damage to vehicles, and you know, we've got some vehicles in the background here up on the frame machine and, and other vehicles sitting around the shop. And as we're, as we're fixing and repairing these vehicles, for me it starts with the structure of the vehicle. Is the structure of the vehicle right? Uh, because of the, of the, I'm going to use the word assumptions, but that's not a good word. Um, you know, whenever a vehicle manufacturer builds a vehicle, what do they do? They send it down the assembly line, and let's face it, vehicle build tolerances have improved immensely over the years. Um, being a technician who repaired vehicles back in the 80s, uh, we saw some things that were um, a little uh, liberal mm -hmm. on, the, on the tolerances, yep. and so be it. A lot of the vehicle manufacturers were, but over the years, they've tightened up greatly, and, and so as we look at that vehicle coming off the assembly line, I like to use the terms that I've heard from some of the engineers and folks from the OEs that say, as built. This is how we delivered it. This is how it was built. And whenever it leaves that assembly line, once it leaves there, they have no control over what happens to that mm -hmm. vehicle. But they know that, hey, certain things are certain ways, and they've run their calibrations at that OE level. They know that system is performing to, to the specification they set. Now, now, once we get it in, it's been in a collision. You know, okay, all bets are off. You know, what has really happened to that vehicle? Yeah, yeah. Um, is, there, is there structural damage? Is there damage affecting the steering suspension? Is there damage affecting uh, just the body and, and the mounting locations of those sensors? And you know, so as we, as we go through and we ask ourselves these questions, you know, we need to make sure that we have the confidence through all of this that when we get to these calibration procedures, we can confidently say, yes, we, we know that the requirements are there. The vehicle structure is right. Uh, the body is right. The wheel alignment is right. Uh, researching a lot of these procedures, um, I'll find and, and, and you'll see where some of them do have 
uh, a pretty uh, lengthy set of prerequisite conditions that need to be met on the front end before you get to the actual calibration, right? So in other cases, you may find where it's, it's assumed and there's very little in that prerequisite uh, department, as it were. You know, it's assumed that this vehicle is, I want to say, structurally sound, dimensionally correct, the wheel alignment is correct. Let's face it, a lot of the procedures will say perform a wheel alignment or verify wheel alignment before, uh, before you do this. And so that's whenever I think about, you know, the wheel alignment and a calibration procedure, you know, okay, are we confident that things are where they're supposed to be? Mm -hmm. So again, these are just some of the, some of the thoughts that go through my mind whenever I, whenever I think about, you know, repairing collision damage vehicles specifically. And when you said beginning field of view, you know, the field of view is really important. And when you said evolu, you call it evaluation? E elevation. Elevation. And I'm I sorry. believe the evaluation is, is something different. Uh, that's the term you Elevation. Use for... That means where is the sensor looking to? You know, and we have maybe a little bump. We have something that gets fixed. I don't know, maybe not. What I want to say is when, the, when, when, when we going from the field of view a little bit too high, we will not see the vehicle what comes by. That sensor will not report any fault code or anything is wrong. It, it measures nothing. It's nothing getting reflected. And radar is we sending a magnetic sound wave out and expecting it back. So we're not getting anything back. There is no vehicle. So but then the vehicle is coming out. Now we're speaking of the safety of the of the driver. And that's the reason those calibrations have to get take really, really seriously. And the field of view is, is, yeah, the best example what you could bring up and how important it is. It was interesting. I was riding as a passenger in an SUV mm -hmm. that had blind spot sensors uh, mounted in the sides of the lower quarter extensions behind the bumper cover. And I, before I got into this vehicle, I'd actually done the research because that's the kind of thing I do before I go someplace with somebody. I want to know <laughs> what the vehicle has because I need something to do if I'm a passenger. And, and so as we're riding along, I was watching the blind spot monitor on the passenger side mirror. And as we would go by a tractor trailer, in some cases, as we went by the trailer, as that rear quarter panel, as that lower sensor, that rear blind spot sensor went by the trailer, the blind spot light would actually go off. It, it would not be illuminated. It would be illuminated next to the tractor, next to the wheel set, but just for a very short period of time there while that was next to the trailer, it was shooting under the trailer mm -hmm. and missing oh, yeah. the trailer altogether. Yeah. You know, it, was kinda, yeah. it got me to thinking about, wow, that's got to have a pretty tight, and we were, well, let's face it, we're cruising down the highway and we're two foot away from you know, that as we're, as we're passing them or they're passing us. And uh, so it got me to thinking about that, that whole scenario mm -hmm. of, Okay, well, obviously there's a, there is something very evident beside us, and it's, you know, it's not an issue, but it just got me to thinking about that field of view. Now, speaking of, you know, we're looking at blind spot sensors, and these are mounted in an angle back here. Some of them are on mm -hmm. the side. You know, this presents the greater opportunity for the rear cross-traffic alert and things like that, which are just features and enhancements of what you can get out of, I'm going to say, the technology. Yeah. And it's impressive, the technology, in that here they've got what looks like a flat antenna, what it is to me that I would think would just shoot something out straight and then shoot something back. But through the design and the evolution of the technology, they have uh, developed ways to take and send a broad spectrum beam out that, you know, mm -hmm. that then takes and identifies objects out there. So the forward facing radars, and I know the camera's not in, not in the, uh, not shooting the Kia that's sitting right here behind us or right in front of us, but, um, you know, with the forward facing radars, they tend to have a, a very, I'm going to say, narrow, narrow field of view because they're shooting for long distance. Yep. And, uh, you know, a tighter field of view this way and, and a pretty tight field of view uh, vertically as well. Mm -hmm. But again, the orientation of that sensor becomes, you know, very important for, for where that particular radio wave is, is projecting out and coming back. Yep. Um, so that's a few other things that kind of come to mind for me. and, and we spent uh, a little bit of time getting this set up so that we can uh, have good lighting and the right lighting to see things. Um, you know, we recently uh, visited a calibration facility that uh, had invested very heavily in actually having dimmable overhead lighting so that they could, I want to say, 
set the, the lighting conditions so when they're doing camera calibrations, they can set that um, more for, okay, what are we dealing with outside today? Are we dealing with bright sunny conditions? Is it overcast and cloudy and things like that? And it was interesting in the conversation, they said they noticed that, uh, I'm going to use the word static calibration versus dynamic calibration. During the static calibration, if they set the lighting closer to what was outside for that particular day, they actually noticed that some of the dynamic calibrations, whenever they took that vehicle out and they did the road calibration, the on-road calibration, um, that some of those would pick up quicker and actually accept that dynamic calibration a little mm -hmm. quicker if they had those uh, more mm -hmm. similar lighting yep. conditions. Yep. Uh, I know right now we're in a very tight environment. Um, this does not this is not conducive right here where we're sitting to do a lot of, uh, I want to say, radar calibrations. There's, there's stuff in the background beyond the calibration target and things like that that do present a potential distraction for yep. these radar units as we're doing them. Uh, no different than for cameras, whenever you're doing some of those calibrations, having the right setting, having the right conditions in the field of view of that camera for it to be able to accurately recognize that target that it's supposed to see at the particular coordinates mm -hmm. that they're supposed to be placed at. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a, there's a lot that goes into this. Um, this particular setup we have right here, and we have a reflector target, uh, reflector cone. Um, that cone is actually set at the specified location for, for this particular vehicle. Um, to, to do the calibration on the opposite side, you would have that set at similar coordinates over on the opposite side. Um, the calibration would actually be done with the bumper cover on. We only have the bumper cover off for demonstration purposes. Now, if during a, an attempt for calibration, if that calibration fails, typically the next step is, okay, do you have a code? Follow the code. Or secondly, if you don't have a code, you're going to be doing a physical inspection. You know, that, that's, a, that's a key piece of doing uh, that, that diagnostic on that vehicle. Why did it fail? Uh, is that sensor physically out of position? Is there something wrong with it? And this particular vehicle, actually, if you, if you look for body dimensions for the sensor mounting locations, um, you won't find any, which is not unusual. Um, some vehicle makers do have point-to-point um, -point measurements. Uh, some vehicle makers may have you use plumb bobs that you drop off the sensor mounting locations and compare that to center line. Other vehicle makers may have you come along with a tripod set up and a laser plumb that comes across and they're going to have you shoot over to a center line. And just for discussionary purposes, I'm going to turn on this laser, which is hopefully still pre-aligned with the uh, with the center line, and I'm going to verify that real quick because I have a reflector target up front underneath the center point. And it's really interesting as I look at this particular laser plumb line that's shooting down there, it hits the exact center of the differential. It's pretty much hitting the exact center of the emblem, hitting the exact center of the, so all the way, the marks that we're supposed to be hitting, it's hitting all those marks. This is not Subaru's procedure. This is just an example, kind of a representative example of looking at the relationship of the sensors. We also have a couple of additional laser projectors here and these are these are crosshair lasers and unfortunately we don't have the ability to turn off this line or the other line over there that corresponds to it. The ones we're really interested in are this line and the line Dirk's pointing to right now and typically what you want to see is with these types of sensor setups is that they're a mirror image of each other. They're projecting as, as kind of a mirror image left and right that they are then taking and presenting similar angles. And some of the calibration procedures vehicle makers have do take you down this path for the blind spot type sensors where they'll have you use templates and uh, perhaps print off a sheet or a piece of paper or something like that that shows uh, the angles that are supposed to be presented and place it at the center line mark. Uh, they try to make it so that um, there's, I'm going to say, a minimum of tools and equipment required. Some of them are a little more elaborate than others and do require some very extensive setup. Others are I'll say more simplistic and uh, mm -hmm. get the job done with a minimum of tools. You know, things like plumb bobs. I mean, it's simple technology, you know, and, and I mean, we've got the lasers here, but pulling string lines and things like that works, uh, works very well. You just have yeah. to make sure you're doing it right. Um, some of the mistakes that come in, though, are, um, I'll say, distractions and misunderstanding of the procedures as you go through and do do some of these calibrations. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, you absolutely want to make sure that uh, as you're reading through the calibration procedures, and this one, uh, Subaru actually has you just drop a plumb bob and then do a center mark on the floor. And there's a similar 
Plum Bob and Mark on the floor at the front torque box area off of a reference hole that we've got marked in tape underneath of the vehicle. And as all they have you do is mark off of those a certain distance and where those two distances, the distance from the mark here and the mark there intersect out on the floor where he's pointing to right now, um, X marks the spot. And that's essentially where your target goes, your reflector cone goes, that looks at that sensor. Mm -hmm. And at that point in time, uh, we have set the height at the specified distance or the height that's in the, uh, mm -hmm. in the procedure. And then we'd use our scan tool to initiate the actual calibration procedure. Again, bumper cover on. Now where we've got bumper cover on, if there's a failure in the procedure, uh, again, we're looking at, uh, is there a problem with the bumper cover? Has somebody done a repair or something that, or is there a problem with the sensor, the mounting location? Um, is there body damage? Is there something else going on? So with this simple setup that I have here, as I start to, I'm going to say, bend the bracket or bend the rear body panel because I am actually moving the rear body panel in this particular <laughs> case. And this is not unique to Subaru in any way. Um, you know, there's a lot of vehicle makers that basically mount those sensors on brackets on a piece of sheet metal. And maybe that's a piece of sheet metal or a body panel that has been collision damaged. And I think about the proximity of these sensors and their susceptibility to damage, whether it's a front-facing sensor or a sensor that's uh, located on the side of the vehicle or in this location, and that bump in the parking lot that may or may not leave a mark in that bumper cover that's now moved that panel behind because some of these sensors, they literally, they marry right up against the cover, and I believe we have uh, behind you yeah. uh, cover off of another vehicle, which is, again, not unusual for the vehicle makers to actually mount the sensors in the bumper cover on a plastic bracket or some sort of other bracket that attaches to the bumper cover. And it's, it's reliant upon you know, that mounting of that sensor. I move and, it a little bit. It's really, yeah. yeah. And so, uh, you know, and, and for the most part, I believe that, you know, they've, they've, they've got that taken into consideration that, you know, there there's, can be a little bit of movement there, mm -hmm. which is going to be, I want to say, acceptable in manufacturing and the nature of the parts. Yep. But at the same time, we don't want to see anything that takes it beyond that type of a situation, um, creating a problem with the potential alignment of that sensor. So this is, uh, you know, this is all things we have to think about as we're, as we're looking at doing calibrations and we, I uh, don't believe I have my angle gauge, yes I do, you know, taking things like these uh, digital angle gauges and being able to look at, you know, how is this sensor for its tilt up and down, um, you know, and doing comparisons from side to sides and things like that as we're evaluating uh, potential mm -hmm. movement and damage conditions. Um, being able to use three-dimensional measuring equipment and point-to-point -point measuring and uh, some of the other measuring equipment that's out there as you're yeah. doing body repairs to do comparative measurements where potentially the vehicle manufacturer doesn't have measurements available is something else that you know you need to take a look at and that becomes something that uh, the technician has to understand that equipment and how to do those comparative measurements and how to interpret that information where perhaps uh, specifications don't exist in that realm so <clears throat> yeah <laughs> Jeff, you went on and on and on, I know, and that I'm was. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry, don't worry. I it, was it, like, I'm, okay, I'm passionate that's, about it. I know, I, like me, and uh, it was your turn. And thank you for for going so deep in. And that was a, a great explanation here in in those sensors. But what what shows me when when people wanna invest in tooling and oh, I wanna go into this ADA stuff, let's yeah. say on that, where would be my first go to to get tools? Oh, well, we have to look at the OEM uh, procedures and, and their requirements. Yeah. Um, you know, it's something where uh, a shop needs to evaluate, um, you know, what, 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 are, what are the popular vehicles they're working on? Mm -hmm. You know, wh where are the numbers that mm -hmm. support what you're doing? Yeah. So uh, you definitely want to review your books, so to speak, <laughs> and, and, and see what, you know, to, to, to say I'm going to take and I'm going to be able to fix everything that's out there and calibrate everything that's out there, that's probably a pretty big uh, ticket yeah, yeah, that yeah. you just wrote for yourself. But when I, <laughs> no, when I see like, okay, lasers and gauges and stuff like that and plums, yep. Home Depot would be my first choice. No, well, I'm yeah, I, I, I think about that. And, <laughs> yeah. and so whenever yeah. you're working with something like this, yeah. you know, and lasers and stuff, that's one thing. But, you yeah. know, I, I think about what we don't see 
is, in this setup right now right. Is, is the investment in the in targets, targets and the tooling and the other equipment exactly. that goes along with it. And the, I'm going to say the diagnostic platforms mm -hmm. that, that support getting yep. these procedures oh, done. Because let's face it, there are some vehicle makers that uh, have procedures that require this vehicle to be up on an alignment machine yeah, yeah, yeah. with uh, very specialized calibration rigs that tie in. I did an Audi once, eight hours. <laughs> it, it's uh, it's a steep yep. in, it's a steep investment uh, to uh, you know to, to get to get there. But yeah. the, the precision of the end result, I think, is the really important piece here in my mind of having that confidence that yeah. uh, that we're going to be able to deliver the right end product to the customer, so that whenever they're out they're out there and they're unfortunately in some cases mm -hmm. relying on this technology, maybe a little too much, yeah. um, that they don't get themselves in trouble. Yeah. Okay, Jeff, I think let's go back to Scott and Bod and they can dive a little bit deeper in RTS and oh, thank All you. Right, very good, thank you. So now let's talk a little bit about the partial part section of the website. Uh, you know, one of the challenges that shops have is finding information and understanding when the, the vehicle maker has provided a procedure for replacing parts at a factory seam or sectioning or things like that. Uh, what type of information is on the RTS site to help shops there? So that's going to be the OEM partial part replacement search. And again, this is going to be year make and model specific. So in this example, we're going to show you the Cadillac CT5. And it's, it works just like some of the other searches. When you click on the blue link, it takes you over and you're gonna again see that kind of monopoly card look. And we're gonna break down if the front lower rail has any procedures available because that's one thing that people will spend a lot of time looking for something that doesn't exist. So we wanna save them that time. They can come here, do that quick search and they can know, hey, there's no procedure for sectioning or partial part at a factory seam. So now I'm gonna to have to do full part replacement um, and things like that. So it's it's saving you time from wasting your time looking for something that doesn't exist. Um, one of the other things I like to point out on this page is for the outer unicide, we'll have in there if the outer quarter panel has a rolled hem flange. And that comes from a lot of the repair and replace decisions that you make um, are often based on, you know, can I separate out that seam? And on that particular quarter panel, you can't separate out that seam without destroying that flange. So in that case, a, a used quarter panel would not be an option uh, based on that alone. We've talked a lot about uh, the RTS website here. And what kind of courses would somebody want to look for in order to you know, learn more about sectioning and partial part and all the things that go into it, damage analysis? There are several courses in our current uh, PDP 2.0 uh, that are available in, for example, in the estimating role or in the non-structural and structural technician role that address damage analysis, understanding damage, um, structure, whether it be front, center, rear, uh, just overall structures. And then we actually have a course that's focused on part replacement at factory seams. So that'll deal with those factory seam replacements, sectionings, and things like that. So there are a number of courses available for the ICAR uh, community to take on this to help educate them in this area. So let's talk about another one that, uh, another issue that sometimes is uh, challenging for the collision industry. When a vehicle has been in a, in a collision and we're trying to find the information on restraint systems and what type of inspections are required, what parts are mandatory replacements following a collision, things like that. Uh, does the RTS site have anything that helps shops find that information? Yeah, we actually have this um, the OEM restraint system part replacement search. It's a little bit of a mouthful to say, but basically it's the um, replacement and inspection items for each vehicle. So again, this is going to be based on your make and model. And in this case, we're going to select a Kia Optima. And in this particular case, there's a Kia Optima Hybrid and then there's the regular Kia Optima. And so a lot of those are broken up in a lot of different ways, um, depending on the different packages and things like that. So you get a little bit more of that granular information by the vehicle you're working on. Um, but basically it goes through all of the replacement 
items after a airbag deployment and then the inspection items. So this really just brings together all that information in one spot. It's actually supplied to us by Autotex. So it's available from some other sources, but just for convenience sake, we wanted to have that one-stop shop for you to get that information. So again, you can go and get that information here and then go into the OEM repair manual and get all the documentation and repair procedures that you need. Yeah, being able to understand or to be able to find that stuff all in one place because it's scattered all over the manuals usually. It's not in one spot. It, you know, a lot of times you think you just go to the airbag section, for example, and it's going to tell you everything, and it's not always there. So the, the tool on the RTS site is a, is a tremendous help for collision repair professionals, for sure. And we also have uh, some additional information on this page. It's on some other sections of the website. Um, but on this particular one, we'll also give you a link to the article we wrote on Kia Restraints Wiring because a lot of the times the OEMs sometimes allow restraints wiring repair and other times they don't. And so to know which one you can and can't, it's pretty confusing. So we put these uh, series of articles together and that'll get you to what Kia allows in this case, um, if they allow or don't allow restraints wiring repair. Right. All right, so now let's talk a little bit about the next hot topic for the collision repair industry. It's not necessarily at the top of mind for everybody in the industry now, but it will be soon, right? And that's the, the topic of hybrid and electric vehicles. Yeah, you know, we've got every manufacturer out there that's talking about their plan for EVs, the number of EVs they're going to come to the market with. Some saying that their entire fleet is going to be, you know, electric by, you know, X date. So it's going to be one of the new hot topics. And if we look at that, there's a couple of things that are a few things that people need to understand. And we've got some courses that touch on these things like EV safety, uh, EV inspection and handling, you know, things like that. We have several courses around EV to help them. But what does the RTS site have available to the collision industry to help them understand requirements and safety precautions and things with uh, electric vehicles? So we have the OEM hybrid and electric vehicle disable search. Again, rolls right off the tongue. But in this particular case, we're going to look up the Nissan LEAF, which just so happens to be in the background of us right now. And again, your make model specific, select the blue link. And we do have some information up above, um, that's general information to kind of help you understand some of the different pieces of information around each of these vehicles. Um, originally when we uh, rolled this out, we had the emergency responder procedure on how to disable the vehicle, but uh, we quickly realized that there's just so much safety information around working on these vehicles, how to do it properly, that now we'll give you a step-by-step -step instructions on how to get that information from the OEM manual because there's a lot of other pieces that come in than just disabling that vehicle. There's a lot of other things you have to look at. So we'll walk you through that so you get to that information. We'll also let you know if a scan tool is required to disable that system or if you need a high voltage um, digital volt ohm meter as well. And we have this graphic here and it's really, it's interesting in the manuals because a lot of times they show you a great detail of how to disable that system, but they never show you where the components are actually located. That's often in a first responder guide or in a totally different area that you wouldn't think to look. And so we developed these graphics to show you where the 12 volt battery is located where the high voltage disconnect is and where that high voltage battery is. So you just have a little bit of that spatial awareness of where to even look to take apart something to get to that disconnect. Then we also have um, the hybrid and electric vehicle welding best practice. And that is um, something that was pretty standard across the OEMs um, to dis disconnect both the 12 volt and the high voltage battery just to make sure they're isolated when you're doing any kind of welding to make sure there's no damage to that battery. And then if the OEM has any refinished precautions, um, we list those out as well. And there's just so much information around EV that the collision industry in particular may not be as familiar with. And there's a lot of things they need to think about before they start working on these vehicles. Yeah, I would agree. It's something that the industry probably isn't as familiar with right now as they're going to be very, very soon with all the vehicles coming out on this. So now let's throw this out to Jeff and Dirk in the shop and listen in on a conversation they had earlier about electric vehicles and safety. 
Jeff, everything what um, Scott uh, showed us with the RTS research, especially on the EV disabling procedure, is, is for, in my opinion, great stuff. I was on manufacturer web page and spent so many times to find really where's the procedure described. It, it, that's really, really tough one. And I love to have directly guidance in the RTS web page what guides you exactly through that. And I think when we dived into that earlier, we had how many minutes, 30 seconds we spent to come directly to the right spot. And I spent hours on those web pages to navigate around it. And I think that's a great, great thing. And what I would like to do is show our audience a little bit more of how we disconnecting things, how Nissan in this case, then we have here a Nissan Leaf uh, describe the whole procedure. What is your outcome? What, is, what do you think about the RTS side, by the way? Yeah, so as I do research on a regular basis for my position here at ICAR, um, I find that I'm in and out of all sorts of different vehicle maker websites. And with that, um, sometimes it does get a little challenging to find what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. You know, once, once you're in there and you're in there on a regular basis, generally, you know, it becomes kind of second nature and you, you learn the navigation. But certainly time is important to productivity in the shop environment and being able to go in there and find the information that you're looking for quickly. Um, I find myself sometimes getting a little frustrated and then say, oh, geez, you know, I'll go over here and son of a gun, you know, that, that RTS navigation information helps me out tremendously to get right to what I'm looking for. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's a tremendous benefit and uh, hopefully technicians out there are taking advantage of that uh, information that's there for their use. Yeah, yeah. I want to disconnect that vehicle desperately. I can't wait doing it. And you know, I, I love to be involved in those high voltage technology. And this is a high voltage vehicle. Um, Nissan Leaf, my first time actually I operate, I worked on a Nissan Leaf and that was really, it's really exciting for me. And that's the reason, Jeff, let's do it. huh? Let's so, so before we get too much further along here, just a couple things really, really quick. Um, the, the charging port. And uh, again, this is kind of a common mm -hmm. sense thing, but, but it's very important to understand mm -hmm. that anytime we're going to be working on one of these vehicles, yeah. um, you know, this uh, probably shouldn't be plugged in all the shouldn't time. Shouldn't be, yeah. It's a really important point. I want to point that out a little bit more than the contacts in the battery. Usually when we have a normal situation, we bring the vehicle, uh, we drive to the city, we park it in a parking garage, and there is a charging po a point. What you're doing, you park your car there, you plug that vehicle in, you lock your car and you go away. Usually when you unplug your car and you yeah, stop the ignition and stop your car from running, what is going on in the car, our contacts in the batteries open up and the battery is not live, the system is not live. But when we're plugging this guy here in, we want to charge the battery, that means we have to close the contacts and this is the case always when our charger cable is connected um, our contacts will be closed and this is dangerous for us working on a vehicle that means i understand we want to have a full charged battery what is good for the customer later and so on and so on but we working on the vehicle we're working on a high voltage system first thing first rule unplug this cable please have that memorized and this is really forgotten really quick Okay, so the next thing we want to touch on just really, really quick is uh, high voltage safety gear, personal protective equipment. Now this particular vehicle, we've already pre-scanned it and we've verified there are no high voltage faults in the vehicle. There are some faults in other systems on the vehicle, but right now, so far as the high voltage system, we have high confidence in the overall electrical integrity of the system. But we're gonna transition over here to our gloves just really, really quick. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've got some nice welding gloves over there next to you, Dirk. Okay. And they're great for welding, you know, working with hot stuff and sparks and things like that, but they are absolutely not high voltage safety gloves. So what I'm doing uh, with them now. Yeah, you can, you can put those aside. Uh, we also have some nitro gloves, some green ones and some black ones, and there's blue ones we don't have sitting there, but lots of different colors. Uh, they too are not high voltage safety gloves. They're great for working with chemicals and other things, so we uh, absolutely don't want to trust our lives to those. So what are those? Uh, so, so here we've got some uh, Lyman's gloves. So here are the rubber Lyman's gloves that we would typically be using whenever we're working with, or there's a suspected high voltage exposure risk. And, and so 
it becomes a, an additional safety redundancy for you personally that if there is some unknown fault or compromise, um, this is your last line of defense if there are other issues in a vehicle. Now again, with this vehicle, we've got pretty high confidence that there aren't going to be any issues and we'll kind of proceed forward. We also have the leather protectors, uh, which are of course to be used over top of the lineman's gloves. Those leather protectors should not be used for any other type of work other than with those lineman's gloves so that we don't end up with any metal splinters or anything like that. Uh, they are there to protect the lineman's gloves from getting punctured or damaged whenever you're doing work. So also available, and we don't have them right here, are cotton liners which help out tremendously whenever you're wearing those uh, lineman's gloves because they kind of, uh, I will say, get stuck on your hands if your hands perspire a little bit. So we've already looked at the Nissan procedures on shutting this vehicle down and in the procedures for this particular vehicle, uh, step one is the key is turned off, the ignition's turned off, and the key is, as Nissan's procedure describes it, on your person as the technician. Uh, we prefer to take and put that key in a lockbox on the other side of the shop, and it is currently in a lockbox on the other side of the shop. So we do have that key secured very, very well. And the next step in that procedure is to take and disconnect that 12-volt battery. Now, we have both terminals disconnected. The procedure calls for the negative terminal only. I like to take that extra step of uh, safety precaution and take and disconnect both cables. Uh, ultimately, we've got those taped off so that they can't migrate back over and accidentally make contact again. Dirk, why the extra precaution of disconnecting the 12 volt battery? You already told me the contactors opened up when we shut the ignition off. Contacts is definitely one point. Another point is all the control units on this vehicle running still on 12 volt. CAN bus, communication, everything is 12 volt. So it means we taking off the 12 volt battery or disconnecting the 12 volt battery, my control unit are shutting down. That means there's no communication anymore possible. And in this case, we open the contacts in the battery. So theoretically, we already did two things to disconnect or shut down the high voltage procedure. We removed the key, ignition shut off, means the contacts in the battery will open up. 12 volt battery, contacts will open up. So this vehicle has a battery disconnect. That's what we learned. And the battery disconnect is actually in the car. And that would be then my third step for a disconnecting procedure. As a lot of people know me, a lot of people hear it on my weird accent, I'm German and we Germans are crazy with regulations and other stuff. And uh, in Europe is really a regulation in place. What defines those disconnecting procedures here in the United States, you are typical American to me. No, I'm kidding. Uh, um, it's no regulation in place. It's that different. means it's we have to follow 100% the manufacturer guidelines. And the manufacturer guidelines here, that's what we're just doing. Uh, key out, battery disconnect, uh, but 12 volt disconnecting, and then high voltage battery Now, before we go back to the uh, interior of the vehicle and look at that high voltage disconnect, I want to speak generically, step away from the Nissan just for a second, yeah. and, and think about other vehicle makers. You know, they may have you actually in that high voltage shutdown procedure uh, before you disconnect that 12 volt battery. They may have you do certain things and then use a scan tool to verify the contactors are open and that there's no, no issues or faults or anything like that before you go to that additional step. Or in some cases, they don't even have a high voltage battery disconnect. You know, it's, it's reliant upon the contactors opening and the verification with the scan tool or whatever other measures they have in place. Let's talk a little bit about this battery disconnect versus service disconnect. And I want to and I want to show that and I would say let's go inside and discuss that a little bit inside the car when we're disconnecting the battery and we will go over there and, and check this out. All right. <clears throat> so now we are in the passenger cabin here on the back side and um, the disconnecting yeah, battery disconnect is exactly under this when I were reading the Nissan descriptions. Absolutely. You'll have them with you. So I have the procedure here, and uh, as we take a look at this, it requires just removing this cover. And then there's also a metal cover underneath, which has three bolts. We've already removed those, and we remove that. Now, I like having a procedure, if I'm not really familiar with these service disconnects, to make sure I understand how the interlocks work 
yeah. on those connectors because uh, typically whenever you come down in here, you don't want to be going down in with screwdrivers and things like that. Uh, you, you risk damage in the disconnect. So as, I, as I've already read through the procedure, uh, it leads me to take and pull up part way. Then there's an additional tab right here that I have to then exert force backwards on to continue lifting the lever around, and that takes and removes the service disconnect. Wow, you did and, a good job with that, the glass. Uh, it worked out pretty well. Now, <laughs> the procedure actually guides you to take and put some sort of insulating tape over top of that uh, service disconnect location, and we'll do that so that we can keep any debris from going down in there, and uh, hopefully alert folks, you know, they shouldn't be uh, tampering with that in any way, shape, or fashion. Um, this service disconnect will take and will secure in a location Probably in the lockbox with can the I keys. Can I get it? Um, can I check it out? You know, what's kind of interesting about that is I see the two big terminals, mm -hmm. and I understand that those two big terminals break the connection somewhere in the cell series circuit. But yeah. I also notice there's two smaller connections in there. Can you tell me what those two smaller, mm -hmm. yeah, smaller terminals a, do? Uh -huh. Interlock. We call it interlock. And the interlock is through every component or every plug in the whole high voltage system is always an interlock. Two small, maybe I hold it here under the camera, you can see here in the middle those two little pins. It means Jeff removed that, <coughs> um, that plug here or that battery disconnect. Now we interrupt the circuit of the interlock. In this moment, yeah, we have another information for the control unit. Hey, somebody pulled something out. Then it's not only in the battery disconnect, as I said, it's in every connection, high voltage connector in the whole vehicle. So this is a safety, a really, really important safety measurement or feature in my opinion. Then when somebody has no clue, the system is live, you would pull a cable, this interlock will open and we open the connectors in the battery to shut down the systems in regards to safety. Now, what about the systems that don't have this type of a service disconnect? What happens then? Good. Now we are on the point. Battery disconnect, service disconnect. So, maybe I hold it a little better. I hold it under our second camera so, as so well. So this one doesn't have an appearance of being on the high voltage circuit at all. Exactly. This is a 12 volt system, as well as this little, little yeah, cable, this interlock here. This is, you can compare it with an interlock. Then when we pulling this guy here out, we will disconnect, we will disconnect this interlock and then the uh, batteries, uh, the batteries uh, connectors will open up and our system is disconnected. On the side here, the little hole, what's that typically used for? The little hole, good that you said it, I had brought a little padlock here with us and I put that padlock in this little hole and this is a really important thing for those systems then you were saying this guy you're putting into put in the lockbox in the lockbox that means this guy is gone nobody and, can and take it and I'm the only it. one that has access to the lockbox yeah in this case here you lock that and you take the key and put it in the lockbox that nobody can uh, yeah, switch. Now, typically on a, on a real vehicle, this yeah. would have wires coming out the other exactly. end of this connector that yeah. tied in with the wiring harness for the control exactly. circuits for this the. This is uh, an example from a BMW. This is a BMW uh, service disconnect. What is usually an i3 has it in the front, in the motor hood area, front left, or the, the 3 Series BMW has it where the battery is located on the back right side. It's somewhere located and yeah, what is the procedure here is you put your ignition, you sh switch off your ignition, you switch, uh, you disconnect your 12 volt battery. And you were saying then would be a good idea. You were saying before we had this discussion a little bit. Can you remember you were saying, ah, maybe I disconnect the 12 volt battery later. I will do the same when I have a service disconnect. Then I want to see if I get a message in the, uh, on, my, on my control, on my dashboard. Information display. Yeah. Information display. Thank you. That means I would disconnect or push, pull the service disconnect, switch on ignition, and then you get in the display a message, service disconnect pulled, 
the high voltage system deactivated some message you get and that would give me as a technician already a good feeling I'm on the right track to disconnect the system. Or perhaps there's a verification on a scan tool of or something like that. Yeah, you can verify it on the scan tool, you have it on the dashboard. The next step is then of course disconnect, uh, get a um, switch off ignition, lock the key away, disconnect your 12 volt battery and then verify zero potential. Zero potential means verify the system is not live anymore. So I've noticed in, in some cases, some mm -hmm. vehicle makers will actually have dummy plugs mm -hmm. that go in some of the connector yep. locations yep. that better seal and secure those yep. locations. Yep. Yep. And with the low voltage disconnect, I've also noticed uh, sometimes, I want to say under the hood, up front in many cases, they'll have like the first responder cut loop but it's actually on a connector. Mm -hmm. And yeah. for the first responders, as I understand it, the yeah. cut loop is there. That's the quickest way, uh, I want to say, <laughs> to, to cut that 12-volt circuit. Versus yep. for us in service, uh, the procedure might be to just take and disconnect that connector mm -hmm. and not run the, the cut loop, yeah, yeah. per se. Yeah, that cut loop for, for uh, first responders is really important. Uh, by the way, you can find rescue sheets and every manufacturer produced those rescue sheets where you can see where is the cut loop. So when any first responders here on that show uh, download them, you can really Google them easily, put the manufacturer in, put the vehicle in, Nissan Leaf, rescue sheet, put it on Google and you will get it pretty, pretty quick. And you can download that and then you are know where is the battery located, where is the battery disconnect, where is um, that uh, loop for so, so for us service through. technicians, though, it's mm -hmm. important that we're, we are accessing the service procedures because they yeah. will go into more detail about some yeah, of the additional yeah. steps that are necessary to verify voltage is shut down. And we're going to take a look at some of that here very shortly. Yep. Perfect. All right. So we've disconnected the battery uh, safety disconnect up in the interior. And the last step in that procedure actually asks us to wait for 10 minutes, minimum of 10 minutes, after pulling that before we proceed with any other operations. Why do we have to do that, Dirk? Good question. The 10 minutes are really, really important. Uh, then we have an inverter, and an inverter is a an rectifier. And yeah, working in a rectifier, you need capacitors. How you call them? I call them capacitors. Uh, sometimes another... they're referred to as condensers. That's, condensers. An, older, that's an older term yep. that uh, yep. Yep. sometimes you still see in some of the modern service information. Uh, okay, I, I never heard that word before, but you know, my German English, English German is capacitor. So we have intermediate circuit capacitor in, that, in, in the inverter. What is a capacitor? It's like a storage, it's like an accumulator, it's like a battery. That means now the system feeds, and I think we have here a 400 volt system, feeds the capacitors with 400 volts. So now we know the battery is disconnected, but we don't know how long it takes that the capacitor is discharging. And this is really, yeah, that's really dangerous. When you're not doing it, we are unplugging here um, our cable, somebody touch it, we can get electrified and we can die. So capacitors, discharging time, it's really a serious thing. When the manufacturer says 10 minutes, we have to follow those 10 minutes. There is an active and passive discharge, but this is another story. I don't want to go deep into active and passive discharge uh, right now. Then an active discharge should be directly discharging it, but we are not sure that everything works. That's the reason passive, passive discharging time is 10 minutes at Nissan and that's so what we just we, we just wait we follow we the procedure wait. We, we wait and we, then, we then we have waiting. to continue with our verification correct okay yeah so right. now let's wait 10 minutes how was your weekend it was great no fabulous well, I'm kidding. we've already waited okay. the 10 minutes though so the next step in our procedure is going to be for uh, me to take and disconnect the connectors now these these connectors one of them is the main harness connector coming out which goes up to the motor drive unit and inverter converter unit and the other one is to a PTC, a positive temperature coefficient heater unit. Um, and in order to take and find the procedures to get these apart, because they have a series of interlocks on them to take and disengage the connectors, uh, we actually have to take and look at the uh, 
high voltage circuit verification uh, procedure, but that hyperlinks out to a different procedure that gives me all of the steps and in the interlock sequence in order for me to disengage these connectors. And it's kind of intricate. So it'll take me just a moment here to, uh, to come up in here and disengage these connectors. So as I take and get the first safety latch to remove, the uh, safety assurance connector to remove, and the other interlock to remove and pull the connector back, uh, I can, and sometimes you have to wiggle them just a little bit and work them just a little bit. And what's really important is that you've already cleaned away any dirt and debris and stuff like that from around the connector and that the connector is dry. So we have the, uh, the main harness connector disconnected. I'll just put it off to the side and then I'll yep. work on the uh, PTC connector next. And that one's a little tricky for the uh, safety assurance connector and the main release tab. And then that one comes off like that. And so now that we have those, uh, those disconnected, the, the procedure actually guides us to use a DVOM or uh, perhaps some sort of other tester, but their procedure shows a DVOM in order to take and measure voltage on each of these connectors. And we'll start with this connector first. And so I believe you have a couple test instruments yeah. there that we're going to take a look at. What do you, you have? You were saying DVOM. I have uh, digital one Digital voltmeter. Yep. yep, that's what I I'm used to here. using. I have another one here. It's this device. You ever seen this? I have never used one of those before. As a, you know, this is my favorite, by the way. I love those devices. It's called a two-pole voltmeter. So, okay, what is the difference between a multimeter and a two-pole voltmeter? So, Nissan says use this. I say I want to use, I w would like to use this. So, we usually we're following um, the manufacture procedures, but in this case, um, maybe you trust me. Now, the reason is why I like to do this. This is a voltmeter what measures only voltage. It's not depending on an external battery like this one. Here, I need a battery to operate. So when the battery, here is a battery inside for some additional features, but when the battery would not work and I measure a power source like the 400 volt battery, it would show me 400 volts. Another big thing on that device is that I don't have to do anything. I go and measure. I can't make any mistakes. Here I have to set voltage. What are we measuring? DC? AC? DC volts. DC volts. Yeah, we are on the DC side. And yeah, and here that's the easy way. That I would like to use this. Can we do that? So I've used the multimeters for a long time and uh, various different brands. I always make mm -hmm. sure that if I'm using a multimeter, I'm using a good quality meter that I trust my life to at that yep. point in time. Yep. Yep. And there's also a verification procedure, whether you're using a two-pole tester or a DVOM, uh, where we'll take a known good voltage source. And mm -hmm. this is about a 14-volt uh, nickel metal hydride battery stick that yep. came out of a uh, hybrid vehicle battery pack. And what he's going to do now is just test his two-pole tester. And what's kind of neat about the two-pole tester is in order for that to work, he's got both of his hands on the insulated part. Uh, he's not getting up there on the metal probes. He's well away from uh, those probe tips. And that keeps him working safely, even on a potentially live circuit. Mm -hmm. um, so it keeps him at a safe distance. And so he's now yeah. verifying 14 volts. There is voltage there. Mm -hmm. And something else that's kind of neat about these two pole testers that he just taught me about very recently is that there's a button on each of the handles mm -hmm. that uh, oh, cool. he can take and while he's measuring voltage he can push those buttons and that actually loads the circuit a little bit. So if there is any, uh, I've heard the terms ghost voltage or just stray voltage still floating on the wires, uh, that would just load the circuit slightly in order that uh, it would dissipate any kind of uh, charge that was there. Mm -hmm. It's not meant to discharge the high voltage capacitors or anything like that necessarily, but uh, that gives us again a little more assurance of the reading that we're seeing. Now we're doing this test right now to verify the tester is working on a known good source. Yep. Now he's going to transition up here to the connector. Let me let me say one another word. Okay. Multimeter, two volt meter, a uh, two pole volt meter. This guy shows us 14 volts. It shows us not 14 volts, 0 0.5, 6, 7, 8, whatever. Right. And this is what we are not interested in. We want to verify that we are in a low voltage area, what is minimum below 60 volts. So, so we're not looking for the accuracy We're here. not looking for the accuracy. Uh, but, we wanna, but generally that within a volt or two, or we want to see that it shows us now right. zero, of course, and not 400. Right. 400, 
hey, we have a problem. Interesting that the procedure says you're supposed to be measuring for five volts or less at this connector, yep. Yep. and I would expect to potentially see zero volts as you go up here and in test. Okay, I um, hear it. I'm not sure it. what I the meter is reading because I can't see it, but I'll let you know. Zero volts. I hold it towards okay. the camera that our colleagues can see it, but zero volts, and okay. we verify zero volts. Now, I verified high voltage plus to high voltage minus. Okay. Okay. This is also what the procedure shows us on the Nissan side. European standard, and you know I like to do that, is always high voltage plus towards high voltage minus, okay. high voltage minus towards ground, okay. and high voltage plus towards ground. So you're ground. saying if there's any potential so faults? When we talk about a certified um, disconnecting procedure, what a lot of the European manufacturers following, they make you three measurements. That's the reason I'm on a safety side. I like to make three measurements. That means I go here and I'm looking for a nice ground point. Let's, let's go here. I like to say there's no overabundance of precaution when yep. you're working with uh, high voltage. So my, it's not illuminating nothing. Okay. Um, that means in this case, let me go here. Um, here we have zero volts. Let me, yes, now I'm on a contact. Good. Nothing is lighting up. Okay. I'm 100% sure. There is no potential on this. On so this the rest side. of the Nissan procedures has us verify on the PTC connector the same thing. Yep. Basically okay. looking to see that there's uh, five volts or less. Hopefully there we're at zero volts. Zero yep. volts there. Okay, and I do here the same thing. And I go on the high voltage plus side and high voltage minus side. Now That's after, all he's, good. after you've done that, yep. it's, it's also a good practice to come back to your known good standard. Thank you. And really verify good. that our ah. meter is still. That nothing volts. went wrong. So we've got very high confidence that what we've read here is accurate and true and that we don't have any issues. Yep. Now, I also realize that in Nissan's procedure, they don't have us measure at the battery. Correct. Um, yep. Some vehicle makers may have verification procedures where there's special test harnesses that plug in, or they actually have you come in mm -hmm. with a DVOM or some sort of voltage tester right. and verify that there is no voltage at the outlet of the contactor. Yeah, yeah. You know, I would do that every time that I measure both sides. For example, for an insulation test, what we most likely will perform, you t check your insulation in both directions. You check the insulation towards the battery as well. So it means the potential that I go on this side is really high. That means I would always recommend measuring both sides when I open up and harness like this, definitely. So, yep, tape so it up. I'll take and tape these off yep. in order that they're protected. Keep fingers out of there, and then we'll uh, transition back mm -hmm. out from underneath of the vehicle and take a look at some things. You, you know, Jeff, I'm pretty sure a lot of our yeah, <laughs> people who are watching this thinking, oh, maybe this is a little bit crazy what they're doing. Two pole volt meters, three times verification. Yes, it seems like a little bit crazy, but you know, we talk about 400 volts. The safety here is the most important thing. 400 volts, I make a mistake, I touch something, the potential I'm dead is to 99.9% .9 happening. Does your wife have good insurance on you? Good question. I have to think about that. But I like my life, and that's the reason yeah, I do a kidding. little bit more steps <laughs> as is maybe necessary um, to keep safe and stay safe. And uh, that's Absolutely. a really important part here. Yep. yep. Okay, Let's very good. Put it down and make some, right, make some other good. magic happen. I'll, I'll follow you out. Okay, let me grab my multimeter. We don't want to destroy that. So, Dirk. I've heard a little bit about uh, terminology uh, around electric vehicles, and I want to understand electrical bonding a little bit better. And I notice on this vehicle, there's a large cable going from the uh, inverter drivetrain control unit, looks like over here on the top, over to the chassis of the vehicle, almost like a ground cable. And, and if the battery were connected, it would connect to the negative battery terminal. Now, I know this vehicle does not have a gasoline engine. There's no starter motor. You know, <laughs> so why does it still need this large, heavy cable that's that's going over mm -hmm. there to that to that module. Help me understand that concept. You know you open Pandora's box right now here? Huh? Probably. Probably. Okay, how I can make that short. Bonding is 
one of the most important things on electric vehicles. It's our lifesaver when you want to say that on this way. You know, our high voltage system is completely isolated. High voltage plus, high voltage minus, isolated from the whole system. But when we have an insulation failure, for that maybe to measure, we need an insulation tester, but this is a different story. Insulation, I mean, sorry, an insulation failure would that high voltage plus or minus has a conductor towards the housing or towards anything of those components. So now you show this really thick, nice bonding cable. What bonded every high voltage component with each other together over the chassis. That's what we are using as bonding. What is your body resistance? You have an idea? Uh, probably right now my outer skin oh. resistance is pretty high because pretty my skin is so dry, but Ooh. internally it's relatively low. We say like 1000 ohm. That's like a typical body resistance when you would get a shock comes into your hand and maybe goes through my body onto the to the ground where I'm standing on. Then we talk about 1000 ohm body resistance. What do you think is the resistance of this nice thick cable? I would think that'd be extremely low. Okay, where are we going now as electricity? We're going towards the lower resistance. That means would be on a housing 400 volts in regards to an insulation error and I would touch it. This would save my life. It would not save my life when I touch a second insulation error component. So this is a first error redundant um, or yeah, safety, safety yeah, precaution, can I say that? A second failure, that would be a problem. There is no, no, no safety. So, so potentially if, if there were a fault within a module Let's where say high voltage housing. would then come to the housing, it would essentially electrify the chassis of the vehicle to that potential relative to the other <laughs> pole of the high voltage battery, I which is still you. isolated. Yep. And it would take me getting between that and that other pole to, to get electrocuted. Um, within that, there's a lot of complex um, concepts that go along with it. And, and I'll tell you, we, uh, we put a lot of effort into our understanding high voltage safety mm. course. Yep. And yep. we go into a lot of detail about this concept and map it out uh, pretty methodically so folks can uh, understand it mm -hmm. um, more granularly. It's a, I know it's an extremely important concept. Um, it's, it is a safety redundancy in the background. And you know, it's something that some vehicle makers call out more, uh, more importance on mm -hmm. and others maybe not as much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, even on hybrid vehicles, it's, it's a consideration where you have high voltage systems. And don't forget the insulation guard. Every high voltage system is equipped with an insulation guard. That means what we want to, we want to check on, on a constant base, how is the insulation? Are we still protected? So when you say guard, it's being monitored. It's a monitor. Insulation monitor would be a good wording as well. That means this insulation monitor checks always the component housing if there is any high voltage leak detecting. So now you have to think this big cable, what you just pointed out, is completely oxid oxid oxidated. It maybe has no contact, broke down. It's a really, yeah, it's defect. So now we have no loop between the ground, the insulation monitor, and our you know, high voltage system. It will not detect anything. And it's okay, then we don't want to detect anything. But the cable is bad, and maybe we have an insulation fault on the housing, and the system can't detect it and can't produce a fault code. So that's the reason why it's so important um, that the bonding is good. And that's the reason that a lot of manufacturers, as you said, they always check the bonding of the components. When we're changing an inverter and high voltage heater or whatever, every high voltage component and we change a component, it's always important that we make sure that the bonding is good after we yeah, bolt the new components to the chassis or do we have a wire or cable like this that this is really okay. And for that, we need a milliohm meter. 
So I can't just use my traditional DVOM. I have a lot of faith in my traditional DVOM. I like it a lot, and I've done a lot of resistance I have, measurements. I have a brand new Fluke one. It's, I think, a great multimeter, but we're not ca we can't measure milliohm in this scale. What we could do, for example, with a specified milliohmmeter. And what we're doing with this millimeter is we measure on a method what is called a four-wire measurement method. So we have now four wires. One is applying a current, a measurement current. And one amp is a good measurement current. So what we could do is we don't need a fancy millimeter like what we have here. Let me switch it on. Um, what is, by the way, not, uh, not actually cheap. This is a really cool thing, then it's really easy to handle. Then I have this probe, and I, I don't know if you can see that on the probe. Each probe has two, how you call them? Two terminals. Two terminals. Or probes, Thank yeah. you. Ah. Tips. I'm always happy to have somebody who can speak English with me. So now my thing is not holding anymore. Ah, come on. Okay, I have now two terminals of one. One is applying one amp goes to the other, and the other one is a voltmeter. So now we have amps and we have measuring volt. We know current, one amp, we measure the result of voltage. So now, Ohm's law, we can calculate. And that meter does it internally very accurately. And that, yeah, for, for that I, money. I, I know I my traditional DVOM, I know it puts a small amount of mm -hmm. uh, current through a circuit to measure resistance. It applies yeah, a small yeah. voltage. Yeah. essentially interprets that as, as some current flowing through that and then does let, the calculation. But that, that is a at a very bit. low yep. uh, voltage level and they're in a very low current flowing through it. So what you're saying is by applying one amp, that allows us to more accurately identify very small resistance small variations resistance, yeah. that might exist where we would never detect that with even yeah, some of yeah. our better quality DVD you know, items. And what you do now, you have your cable. Now we have actually a measurement of this cable. You can tell me how long is this cable? How long is it? Uh, the cable's about two foot long overall. Okay, that's like maybe, 80 maybe centimeters. Longer. I'm, you know, metric guy. Three feet is a meter approximately. So my when I would measure now from one point to the other, I would expect a measurement of like 0.8 milliohm, a little bit below one milliohm. Three feet should be one milliohm. This is an expectation what we have. And this is a guideline for us. Is it much higher than I know? My bonding is not that great. Okay, and I, I can make perform here one yeah, measurement. So show me the accuracy one. of how this works just on a piece of steel. Just uh, on and I would expect, you know, with a traditional DVOM, if I did this, yep. I'd see zero ohms. Zero ohms, yeah, yeah. Let me go. Especially if I zeroed my meter out I pushed that a little bit down, my two probes. I have to see. And we have 0 0.0469 milliohm. Really accurate. Okay, when I'm going now a little bit farther away, what we're expecting, a higher result. It should go it? up. Yep. Let's do this. And what we're getting out here, and this is a piece of steel, 0 0.18 milliohm. So, on a distance as you described, I expect around 1 milliohm, what would be a good result. So now, you know, I'm a European, European have their regulations. In this European regulation, what is pretty cool, that's the reason why I like regulations, and it's also defined what's supposed to be there. And that one meter, or three feet per milliohm is one number in that regulation. And the whole system, every component in that should be under 100 milliohm. So now we have a guideline and we know what is good and what is bad. And that's what I need as a technician to know. I, what I know I'm I've measuring. seen references to this in some of the service information uh, from different vehicle makers, where as, as things are being reassembled, yeah. they'll, they'll have you as one final step in that procedure doing this a resistance test, this milliohm test, yep. and they'll have specifications typically for the different points that they're having you do their measurements on. So milliohm meter, my opinion, a really important tool when I'm working on EVs. Isolation or insulation tester is another important thing um, to check really, and this is a mega ohm meter. No, too big again, M so how, or so small. So how does that become different from, again, <laughs> my, my traditional DVOM? I'm measuring resistance. Yep. And if I'm checking something, I'm looking to see if there's shorts or, you know, some sort of condition there. Um, gee, you know, if I see infinite 
infinite resistance, I think, hey, everything's okay. Yeah. But is it really okay using a traditional meter versus the test that this applies? So how, do, how does this differ? Okay, the difference is here we're working with a current, one amp, as we described. Here we're working with a test voltage. So what we want to do is we are on a 400 volt system here. To really make a test under load, we need minimum a capacity of a two volt can apply 401 volt. This is also like a little guideline. We have to be always one volt higher as the system require system, yeah, has a voltage. Um, so we have here 400 volt. We apply 401. This guy can here this uh, insulation. You can select between 500 and 1000 volts. So in this case, I would select 500 volts and apply high voltage plus against ground, high voltage minus against ground. To verify is there any insulation area, error between my high voltage plus connector and ground. So now we are back on bonding. Remember, when your bonding cable would be not unhooked, I can measure and I would never verify any insulation error. So, so if there is a breakdown of insulation someplace that my traditional meter might not read, yeah. uh, this is, I want to call it a stress test. That's a stress test. To a certain test. degree. One uh, side is a stress test. What requires a good bonding? Very so good. always comes, everything comes back to bonding. That's the reason I think it's so important to talk about it and really make people aware, hey, bonding, this is no joke. And, but these cars are running. We are here in Wisconsin. I'm going out there. There is snow out there. Now yeah, we there's chemicals. There's, there's chemicals, chemicals they use on the road. And that, how uh, is that in five, ten years? And then when right. we're getting into contact with this cars, five years after an accident um, and we have to fix some stuff, that's a huge challenge what our industry is facing in my so opinion. These are these are complex topics that mm -hmm. ultimately folks that are working on these vehicles need to understand and yep. you know I have a very strong belief that if I understand what I'm working with and the potential of what can go wrong um, how the vehicles are engineered this helps me gain comfort not 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 to be cocky or or yep. overly confident uh, and I don't want to get complacent Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's something that can get you in trouble. So making sure that you have a yeah. firm understanding of the topics and, and the uh, concepts is very, very important. And I know we didn't point that out, but I think the audience saw that vehicle a little bit on a couple of shots from the behind. This is a huge accident. I learned it's a total loss. And the whole EV system is functional. It's still intact. It's still, it still moves itself around. Yeah. I, it's impressive. It's the, impressive. Uh, the engineering yeah. that went into it. And yeah. uh, you know, ultimately, the vehicle did its job structurally. It protected the occupants, mm -hmm. and uh, the vehicle can be replaced. Okay, do you want to more pointing out here? I thought you had a couple oh, I, of I thoughts. I think there's a few other things I'd like to cover briefly under the hood. Um, whenever I think about cooling systems, you know, I know that this particular vehicle has an air-cooled battery, and that uh, there's still a cooling system for the electronics and other components. So, you know, that's something that uh, is, is a topic of consideration for folks working on these vehicles. I know some of the cooling systems get pretty, uh, pretty elaborate, you know, with the different valves and motors and pumps, and especially whenever you start looking at um, where they liquid cool or some other means uh, cool the high voltage battery. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about what, what's going on with some of the cooling circuits and things like that? Yeah, you said it, water-cooled, air-cooled, there are still also air-cooled batteries, but of course the battery is really important that we hold it constantly on one temperature. Different manufacturers have different temperature levels for a battery, but for the lifetime of the battery, really, really important. And then you say coolant, cooling pump, and that's like, I think, a little bit more our error field, what we see in the future that maybe a uh, cooling pump is failing or a thermostat is not operating, things like that. And that's then like our new, our new, yeah, you know, you don't have a combustion engine anymore. That means our so failure right source is getting actually down. Yeah. And I know when we talked about hybrids or f electric vehicle like that, oh, electric vehicle actually so easy, in my opinion, then four codes of failure 
but it but it's different for a lot of folks. Yeah, I mean, it's there, there are some folks yeah. that are adapting over and they're working on these vehicles yep, on a regular yep. basis and it's having the right training, having the right information, mm -hmm. service information resources, having the right tools and equipment. Yeah. You know, it's a, it's a big investment in order to be able to fix these vehicles correctly right. and that's real important. Um, you know, I, I think about some of the other components that I'll just mention briefly, you know, chillers and PTC heaters mm -hmm. that we've kind of referenced along the yeah, way yeah. that may be parts of these systems that uh, that take and help manage the heat, heat of the battery and the uh, drive motors and inverters and even provide cabin heat cabin for the heat, occupants yep. and yep. the air conditioning. Uh, some of these vehicles may even use heat pump systems mm -hmm. on the air conditioning systems that uh, bring another aspect to, I'll say, working with all the plumbing under the hood with the, uh, the air conditioning. The basic concept is still very similar what we're used to on air conditioning systems. Yeah, yeah. You know, high voltage electric pumps are pretty common on the hybrids as well as uh, absolutely going to be found on the electric vehicles and uh, real important that we've got the right service procedures in place for those as well. So. Okay then I would say let's shoot it back to uh, Scott and to Bob and we... Thanks for joining us. Yep. So the next topic we want to touch on here is glass and I think this is a an area that a lot of times when you talk collision repair this one this one's overlooked a little bit you don't think about the implications for ADAS, for instance, with glass repair, or the different types of primers and adhesives and things like that that are required when you do these repairs. Uh, what is available on the RTS site to help uh, collision repair professionals with glass? So the OEM glass replacement search was really developed um, out of an ask from the glass industry because a lot of their technicians, they weren't really sure, they don't you know, if they haven't cut a glass off of an Audi very often or a GM because of, in their area they just don't have those kinds of vehicles. Um, it was a quick reference for them to find some of that information. So if we look at the Ford um, glass replacement, it goes over what kind of urethane uh, needs to be used, any primers and the things that are approved. And it also covers a lot of the typical ADAS calibrations because once they started putting cameras on the windshield, now they need to be calibrated and just bringing some awareness of that. Um, you still need to use that OEM calibration requirement search to find out on that specific vehicle um, what would need to be done if that camera is present. So this is just, a, again, that quick reference to get you going and then point you to more information. Perfect. So let's talk a little bit now about best practices. I know that I get stopped all the time at industry events or get emails from you know, colleagues in the industry that'll say, does ICAR have a best practice around this? And I'm always telling them that ICAR ourselves, we don't create best practices internally, that it's always something that's vetted through the industry and we have, you know, OEA, or we have summits and things like that to come together to talk about that. Um, what is available on the RTS website to help them understand the best practices that we've worked with the industry to establish? So it's literally called the ICAR best practice page. And, you know, like you said, these were a lot of topics that came out from different questions that we received. Um, and we started to have that conversation. You know, a lot of times the OEMs don't really cover some of that information. And so these best practices never take the place of an OEM procedure or if they have a position statement on something. So if the OEM says you can do something but the best practice says you shouldn't do that, you, you can follow the OEM and it's fine. So the OEM always trumps um, the best practice from that's on this ICAR website. Um, and these are developed by, as you mentioned, having a repairability summit where we bring in industry experts from insurance companies, collision repairs, OEMs, tool and equipment makers, and we have a technical conversation around these different topics. And earlier, when we were on the uh, partial part search, we mentioned the um, rolled hem flange, and that really was developed because we're getting a lot of questions around it. And we started to look at, well, can you really separate out this uh, used quarter panel with a rolled hem flange and put it back on there? And the output from that was this best practice that says, Basically, if it's got a rolled hem flange, it's not a candidate for a used quarter um, because of all the different reasons with adhesive and the metal working on that um, edge and how it can crack. There's a lot of different ones that we've developed 
Um, you know, sectioning apart in the same location twice is another great example because you literally would get a question of, well, somebody else sectioned it, can I section it again? Well, there's nothing from the OEM that says you can't, so we got everybody together, we had those conversations, so it was industry vetted that, you know what, if it's had a sectioning procedure there, you've already heated it and welded it a, a second time, um, that's not a, the best practice to do that, so you need to go to the next available joint so you're not doing any additional damage. So it wasn't ICAR sitting in a back room coming up with things, it literally was the industry discussing this from a documentable technical perspective to develop this best practice. Outstanding. All right, so now let's talk a little bit about 360 videos. Uh, one question I get all the time is what are they? Yeah, I'll start talking to people at, at an industry event, and they'll, again, they'll ask me about, hey, did you see anything about this new vehicle that came out? Or, you know, do you have any information on this? And I'll say, you know, RTS just did a 360 video on that, and they always look at me like that deer in the headlights and they have no idea what I'm talking about. What is a 360 video? Uh, so the 360 videos are something that we came out with a few years ago, and it's really to bring awareness around a particular vehicle. So if we come across some of the research um, on a vehicle and we find, okay, there's a different repair procedure, there's some new things for ADAS that you really should know about, um, we try to highlight some of those differences by walking around the vehicle and talking about the structure and ADAS and calibration and anything that might be unique to that vehicle, um, just so you have that quick awareness. So they're kind of a quick, fun video that just gets you that uh, real basic information to kind of give you a heads up of what might be coming when it rolls into your shop. Outstanding. All right, so now let's talk a little bit about Ask ICAR. This is uh, an, a, a tool available to the collision repair professionals, collision repair industry. If they're looking for information, they don't see it on the Ask ICAR website or RTS website. They, don't, uh, they can't find it elsewhere. They can't find it in the manuals. They can actually submit an inquiry to ICAR and our team, the RTS team, will help them find the information they're looking for. Is that correct? That is can correct. Can you tell us a little bit about how the process works? So we've set up the Ask ICAR search to really be a tool that they can use on demand. So if you have a, a question on a particular make and model or you know, a certain subject, we have a, an entire database of questions we've already been asked and have answers to. And so you can go in there and do a, a real quick search find out, okay, has this question that I have been asked already, um, so you're not waiting for a callback or an email or anything like that. Um, if you can't find the information there, that's when you can submit a new collision repair question, and that will take you over to a form, and you can submit, you know, your, your name, your ID, uh, ICAR ID, make and model, and we can then go and look in the repair information, let you know where it is, and if that information doesn't exist, um, that's when we can initiate what we call our OE linking pin process, where you know sometimes there's just no answer to that question in the repair manual, and we can go to the OEM and ask them directly, you know, can they, you know, is this part allowed to be sectioned in a different location than the manual? And we can, they'll go actually through the engineer team at that OEM and they'll look at the question, and sometimes they say, no, you have to put it in like the repair procedure says. Other times they're gonna say, yeah, you can do that, but under these conditions, sometimes they might update a manual if something was confusing. So there's a lot of different things, but that starting point that we have is Ask ICAR because a lot of times that information is available, they just don't know where to find it. And we've had a lot of people that have spent three or four hours looking for something only to get a hold of us through Ask ICAR and we can show them exactly where that information is in five minutes. Sometimes it's a position statement, sometimes it's in a manual. So you still need access to that OEM, OEM information, but we'll help you find it a lot quicker because we're in these manuals every day. This is what we're doing. And so we have technical experts that really know these manuals and we'll get you to where you need to go. And uh, if not, we'll get you in, connected to the OEM through the linking pin process. And Sometimes it takes a little bit of time for that engineer to review it and come up with a plan, but there's a lot of great information that can come out from the linking pin process and Ask ICAR. Great. All right, Scott, so we've talked about a lot of different things with the RTS site. Is there anything else 
that you think we need to cover to help people understand how to utilize the site and get the most for, uh, for their efforts, I guess, coming to our site? Well, the last area I want to draw attention to is the quick search. And really that's based on, um, you know, you're making model search and it's a way to kind of bring everything together. So in this example, we're going to bring up the Nissan Leaf and we're going to do a search for it. And you can see there's just a, a giant list of everything for the Nissan Leaf and it'll bring in restraints, partial part, calibration and hybrid all into one spot. So if you did a search for a 2019 Leaf, it'll bring up that particular um, model year for all the different searches. And then on all the searches, these different headers on each of the columns uh, on the search results is actually sortable. So you can just scroll through, click through, and it'll sort them by the, uh, each column. And so when you do that, you can find what you're looking for faster by doing a search one time. It brings everything into one spot just so it's easier to get to. So we actually have a, a Twitter feed that we have. So anytime we write an article, we'll tweet about it, uh, letting you know that it's available. So that's kind of how you get to know when we publish an article. Or if we come across something that is interesting, uh, an article somebody else has written or something from um, one of the trade magazines, we'll sometimes tweet those as well because there's some technical information in there you might want to know. And uh, that's kind of the RTS uh, website in a nutshell. Well, I can tell you, you and I have had conversations in the past about, yeah, you, know, you know my background, right? I spent a lot of time in the MSL leadership world, spent some time in the material damage management side and working with estimators and training estimators. And I can tell you that, yeah, you know, I've told you this before, I wish I had understood all of the tools available in our, within the RTS site then. You know, I, I knew that RTS existed. I didn't understand the depth of tools and all of the things that RTS made available to the collision industry to help people get their jobs done more efficiently. So, and, well done. Oh, thank you. And the website was really, it was designed by car people for car people. So, you know, we, when we started building the website, we looked at, okay, what kind of information did I wish I had in the shop at my fingertips to make my life a little bit easier? And, you know, the landscape has changed quite a bit in the last 10 years alone. Um, in the last five years, I think it's even changed even faster than the previous five years. So, you know, we try to always evolve the website to help the industry with what they need, when they need it, um, to make sure that they're getting all the information for complete, safe, and quality repair.